right now I'm here with Max Blumenthal and from the from the gray zone and uh, we're going to be talking about the bread tube. Now what is the bread tube? So bread tube or left tube is a loose and informal group of online content creators who create video essays from socialist, communist, anarchist, and other left-wing perspectives. BreadTube's creators generally post videos on YouTube that are discussed on other online platforms, such as Reddit. BreadTube creators also live stream on Twitch. BreadTube's creators are known to participate in a form of algorithmic... High I don't care about that. So they're supposed to be left We. Uh, people and they're supposedly uh, when the New York Times wrote an article about them, they totally they de-radicalize right wing people into regular lefty stuff. That's what they that's what they said. And in fact, and their funding this is according to Wikipedia, which Wikipedia is worth shit a lot of times when it comes to stuff like this. Many bread tubers are funded primarily by monthly donations on Patreon and refuse income from advertising and sponsorships. Really. As they are not dependent on such income, bread tubers have more freedom to pursue critical critical content. Wait a minute. Well, here's what Caleb Maupin, who wrote a book about them, this is what he said about uh, bread tube and what their real agenda is. They are, you know, playing up. You Ready? Here we go. They are, you know, playing up U.S. foreign policy goals and trying to stigmatize and isolate those who oppose U.S. imperialism, legitimate anti-imperialist, anti-war voices, mainly by trying to equate them with the far right, which is just ridiculous. So what Caleb's saying is that what these bread tube people are, actually, they parrot the United States State Department foreign policy. So they're pro-imperialism. And what they actually do is are there to confuse people and to make them think that people like me, who's always been an anti-imperialist, is somehow bad right winger. He says it. Here we go. Uh, you know, I, I argue that bread tube is dangerous. It is cultivating a generation of people not to be able to tell the difference between David Duke and Jimmy Dore. And if that is not dangerous, I don't know what is. David Duke is a racist, an anti-Semite, a hater, a bigot, a former Klansman. Jimmy Dore is a progressive, anti-war comedian standing up for truth and justice and peace. And, and, and But in the you, know, you look at Vosh's comments, Vosh is trying to psych up his audience to equate Jimmy Dore with David Duke. That's dangerous, and you need to oppose that. And that's why we need to you know, get out there and challenge these people. So we go to the gray zone. They have an article about this very thing, this very phenomenon. It says, leaked files expose serious psyops veteran astroturfing bread tube star to counter COVID restriction critics. So that would be me and Max Blumenthal. We are COVID restriction critics. And I don't know of any other ones on YouTube that consider themselves left by covertly recruiting popular YouTube influencer Abigail Thorne to counter growing opposition to the UK's government COVID restrictions. PSYOPs pros are bringing home the tactics they honed in the Syrian dirty war. Leaked documents have revealed a state sponsored influence operation designed to undermine critics of the British government's coronavirus policies by astroturfing a prominent founder of the bread tube click as anti-fascist YouTube influencers. The project aims to conduct psychological profiling on British citizens dissenting against policies such as mandatory vaccination and lockdowns, then leverage the data to establish a YouTube channel that portrays these critics as dangerous super spreaders of disinformation. I've been a victim of this several times at a very high level. Designed to curb the influence of pseudosciences, pseudoscience material online with specific emphasis on coronavirus related anti vaxxing sentiment, the operation is run by the UK's Royal Institution and dubbed Challenging Pseudoscience. So, this is the government sponsoring people clandestinely, clandestinely to undermine people like me. And they've done it plenty. Its top patron is Charles, the Prince of Wales, next in line to the British throne, who recently hit out at supposed conspiracy theories surrounded COVID-19 vaccines. The organization received a substantial cash injection in 2020 from the UK's government's culture recovery fund earmarked for video production. 
Leaked files obtained by the Gray Zone indicate that the Royal Institution has enlisted the services of Valent Projects. That's a social change communications firm founded by a public relations operative previously involved in the UK Foreign Office's campaign for violent regime change in Syria. So you see where this guy comes from? So you see where these people, these people were pushing a dirty war in Syria, and now they're trying to undermine people like me. Valent has also been sponsored by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, a U.S. intelligence cutout for a project aimed at investigating disinformation. Valent's central role in the operation highlights the trend of information warfare specialists bringing the techniques they honed against targets like the Syrian government back home to the West, where increasingly unpopular governments confront masses of citizens ever bristling at coronavirus restrictions. So the same shit that they used on Syrian government, they're now going to be using on you, the citizen, because you're going against their that government's mandates. As in Syria, where communications firms like Valent created, trained, and instrumentalized media organizations to further regime change objectives, they have covertly recruited a famed British YouTube influencer to lend their carefully calculated messaging campaign an authentic flavor. And there she, and there she is. And who's the head of Valent? There, Valent? This guy right there. Emil Khan. So he's the head of that. And they recruited her to go have people like me and Max. And uh, this is something. Here's a typical tweet from him. He says, Russian info ops aren't what they used to be. Someone going by the name of Kicklenberg is about to publish an article in insert Russian state affiliated media accusing me of being a terrorist propagandist, etc. So far, so yawn. Here's a short thread on what I expected. So anyway, those, there's a, those are the people. Max, now uh, you wrote this article. What would you, first of all, uh, do you have reason to believe this is not only happening in the UK, but it's happening here? Definitely happening here. And the UK is often kind of a testing ground for these kind of information warfare operations. Kit Clarenberg, who is a British reporter who has done some of the best work in unpacking a lot of the leaked files that have emerged out of British intelligence cutouts around the Syrian dirty war, obtained these files from Valent. Um, they, were, they were leaked. And uh, you know, enormous credit to, Crit, to, to Kit for, for pulling this together. And I came in as editor and then provided a lot of background context on BreadTube and brought in Caleb Maupin as well, because Caleb has been writing about BreadTube and came, he, he nailed it in his book because although it was a hypothesis or his own opinion, his understanding of BreadTube as self-described Marxists or socialists who are constantly getting an algorithmic push from YouTube, whereas Jimmy Dore is suppressed and subjected to all kinds of speech codes, when they're getting so much establishment props, getting profiled in the New York Times, that 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 looks suspicious. And it reminded him, as it reminded me, of past intelligence operations to co-opt and divide the left. And that's what BreadTube and many of its figures have been doing. So basically, the files that Kit obtained, what they show is that in order to start undermining people who have been calling out the official lies around coronavirus and just talking about how destructive all these restrictions have been socially, especially to the most vulnerable people. And this is becoming a huge problem in Europe for these governments whose popularities are cratering. It's a huge problem for Boris Johnson. Um, it's why he's pulled back from a lockdown around New Year's. They, they're, they're recruiting the most influential and easily co-optable people who have some left credibility to attack their critics. They don't want to attack them directly. They can't do that. And they can't have like, you know, the, the, the UK foreign office or, or Prince Charles himself come out and say, these people are dangerous. 
no, they need someone who, who seems kind of like, um, seems kind of not just credible, but alternative and attractive and convincing. Abigail Thorne is the perfect person for this. I mean, Philosophy Tube has a million subscribers. It has, uh, she has over 7,000 Patreon subscribers. She's very amiable. The YouTube videos she does on philosophy and history are extremely creative using artisanal sound and costumes and acting. Um, it's, it's really another level. But, you know, you, you, it's not organic, as Kit proved. What was happening here was the royal institution run by the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, was putting up the money for this intelligence initiative. And they had actually been cratering themselves. They'd been running out of money. They were selling off their art collection. The British state steps in through this culture fund as the pandemic is declared, gives them a bunch of money earmarked for video production, which is suspicious. And then they bring in Valent Projects as the contractor and Emil Khan. This is a group that had cut its teeth in the Syrian dirty war, uh, whitewashing extremist, violent extremist organizations like the CIA-backed Free Syrian Army. Emil Khan was directly involved in trying to rebrand them and make them look secular and not affiliated with Al-Qaeda, which they actually were. They were doing all kinds of astroturfing in Syria to set up media organizations to, you know, do white helmet style actions that would all be conveyed back to the British and US public through Western media. And they bring, they're bringing those tactics back to the UK through this uh, project, which they call countering pseudoscience. Revalent projects, they get all these, they do all this research on people who have COVID skeptical views, who are critical of restrictions. And they use that research, basically using the British public as a laboratory for creating this new channel for Abigail Thorne, who is the talent. And it's all covert. Abigail Thorne isn't acknowledging any of this. Abigail Thorne is a founding key member of BreadTube. And so it raises questions about the rest of these BreadTube influencers. I mean, you've got Vosh, uh, who is this gamer, former gamer from Beverly Hills, who you know, is always attacking anti-war leftists. He's always saying, you know, the gray zone is involved in some secret red-brown alliance with fascists, uh, you know, we're sponsored by Russia, all of this, the typical narratives. He called for uh, torturing and kill, uh, sending Julian Assange to be tortured in a CIA black site just to trigger his supporters. Um, he has made so many disgusting statements about anti-imperialist leftists. And then you have... Um, Sean, who made a video about you, attacking you, who I actually didn't know he was affiliated with Bread Tube, but he's considered part of their constellation. And the video attacking you, which relies heavily on official sources, you know, the FDA says that, the World Health Organization says that, it looks a lot like this countering pseudoscience material. And it was very strategically placed. It was algorithmically boosted on YouTube. Oh, it was so, definitely algorithmically boosted on YouTube. No fucking doubt about that, that that was given the favor treatment on YouTube, the CIA and the intelligence uh, beholden that Google and YouTube, they're in bed with the fucking intelligence. Of course they are. Google alphabet, the biggest fucking largest, most profitable communications company in the history of the fucking world. Any company. Of course they are. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupt you. But yes, that was what as soon as I read the story, I'm like, oh, that's 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 they they funded this shit that hit job on me because it was super professionally done. It looked like it had to have some resources behind it. But go ahead. Yeah, no, feel free to interrupt. Um, we, we know how the how we, intelligence in the UK and US operates um, since the end of the Cold War. They operate through cutouts and assets. They don't want to take credit directly. Like Bellingcat. For- like we've, 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 uh, we've revealed Bellingcat on this show when we were reporting accurately about Syria. So Bellingcat's one of these people. They get money from the U.S. government and the U.K. government, and they go and all they are is a propaganda machine to knock down people like us who are telling the truth about the military-industrial complex imperialistic agenda, right? And so they, they, they're they funded by the same governments who are doing this. Really, it's from the military-industrial complex. because anyway, So they get the money, then they do that 
that. And that's what it leaks. They're doing the same thing now with COVID. So anybody, totally. who, anybody who has a counter narrative to COVID, they get money from these people to do a hit job, which is exactly what they did on me. Exactly. Bellingcat is a perfect example. I'm glad you brought him up. One of Bellingcat's biggest funders is the National Endowment for Democracy. Yes. Which presents the itself. The Go NED. Ahead. Yeah, it's the regime change arm of the U.S. government. And they present themselves as uh, a nonprofit, but they're funded entirely by the U.S. government. They work hand in glove with U.S. intelligence. They cultivate dissidents. They fund media outlets in countries where the U.S. seeks regime change. And there's this really remarkable article um, by David Ignatius from the Washington Post in 1991, back when he was a correspondent. I think it's called Innocence Abroad. And in this article, Ignatius outlines a series of what he calls overt operators who are billionaires or you know oligarchs, uh, unions, and NGOs like the National Endowment for Democracy that are doing the work of the CIA to topple post-Soviet socialist governments but and you know by spurring color revolutions but doing it in the open not like the CIA used to do in Guatemala or Iran where they would everything was secret and then when it was exposed it was this giant scandal and so one of the you know the NED is one of the groups he names the NED uh an NED founder Alan Weinstein was quoted in that article saying what we are doing what the CIA used to do covertly in the open I always quote Weinstein because that explains how all of these intelligence operations, especially the, on the information warfare side, function. They get funded through USAID or NED, and it goes to some influencer or some bogus media organization, and it looks organic. And so, it, you know, the hand of intelligence becomes invisible. In this case, countering pseudoscience was not only spun, uh, you know, spun out by valent projects, which is an intelligence contractor. Uh, it was it was funded by the Open Society Foundation of George Soros. And I know you get called an anti-Semite and a conspiracist if you talk about Soros, but Soros is named in that David Ignatius 1991 article as an overt operator who is helping the CIA do regime change in countries where it wanted to topple the government uh, and doing so proudly. So I mean, all the elements are there. It's clear what's going on. And this narrative around COVID has really, is something the establishment is holding on to the same way they were holding on to the interventionist regime change narrative around Syria and attacking all of uh, the critics. And it's not, it's absolutely not limited to this one case of Abigail Thorne being astroturfed. And we will be exposing more in the future, I'm sure of it. I really wish um, Julian Assange was free because I know he would help expose so much of this. Um, and that's part of the point of keeping him in jail is there are so many more establishment deceptions that people like him knew how to expose. These documents, I'm so glad they're seeing the light of day, but there's, there, I guarantee there will be more and more and they need to be reported on. Do you so um how I think it's very pervasive. Uh we'll see. I don't know. Uh but I think I was talking to somebody about this earlier and I was like, uh, so do you think the Young Turks gets this kind of people like them? I'm trying to figure out who is getting this money in the United States. Like TYT has been, you know, so horrible since 2015, and then they got the $24 million and and I'm like, do you think they're getting money from this to, to say that shit about Julian Assange and all that stuff about Syria? Why would they do that? And the person I was talking to said, why would they pay them for doing something they're getting for free? So I, I, I just agree. think the Young Turks are just that shitty. And uh, but it would, wouldn't surprise me if because they, you know, they're desperate for money. They'll take it from Clinton donors. They'll take it from right wingers. They'll take it from anybody. Hedge fund managers. They'll take they have hedge fund managers on their board now. So they'll take it from anybody. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if that turned out to be true. But go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, I noticed they were all promoting that Sean video. They were the first to promote it, the TYT crowd. And I don't, I, but I agree with you. They're doing it. They believe in this shit. Um, yeah. They, they, and, and then they can convince themselves that they, 
that this is what they believe. I, it's just so if funny. it aligns with if it aligns with their opportunities. It's so funny. The whole thing is that Jimmy Dore is a grifter. That's the whole thing. He yeah. doesn't really believe what he's saying. He's just saying this for clicks. And it's like, why would I do this? There's a lot easier ways to fucking make money than trying to get your channel taken down, have the CIA fucking fund people to do videos about you. It's a fucking it's not fun having hit pieces written on written about you in the Washington Post and New York Times, Newsweek, that everywhere, everywhere you go, it's not fun. There's there's a lot easier ways to make money. Why wouldn't I just go suck up to these people or like what Jenk Uger did to to a big media mogul and ask him for a couple of million dollars? That's a lot easier uh, than to actually risk your reputation, stick your chin out and get it kicked in over and over and over again. And by the way, I love what they say, it, you know, the, the, again, the basis of their criticism is Jimmy Dore makes money. He sells T-shirts. Guess what? I, everybody else does, too. And everybody else sells way more. They do. They sell coffee. The Young Turks are selling fucking coffee. Don't they're selling emojis. They're selling emojis. They're selling books they never wrote. Jack Uger literally sold a book and he never fucking wrote it, which is illegal. <laughs> but somehow I'm the fucking grifter. And by the way, for a whole year during the lockdowns at the end of every video, I said, don't give me money. Keep your money. Nobody's got a job. Did anybody else on YouTube? I guess they missed that in that video, too. But I sell T-shirts, so that's proof positive that somehow I don't believe what I'm saying. Anybody who watches this show for a second knows I believe exactly everything I'm saying. And I'm against the COVID narrative. I'm against Fauci. I'm against them suppressing early treatments. I'm against them suppressing any information except vaccines and masks. I'm against that. I'm also uh, against mandates. I'm based on science and based on a lefty perspective for workers. And that's what they are really afraid of. And I and a lot of people on the right agree with this. So this is not a this is left and right agreeing with this and that's what they have to stop go ahead well yeah it's not really a left right issue and that's what makes it so dangerous yes and if you look at the medical freedom movement or whatever you want to call it worldwide it is one of the largest most international and diverse movements uh, social movements and protest movements of our time uh, it gets very little mainstream media coverage for a reason because it's so threatening it's not one of those officially sanctioned protests. And it's not just a bunch of white right-wing extremists running around exploiting uh, coronavirus to advance their Nazi domination dreams. The uh, people of Guadeloupe, which is a French neo-colony in the Caribbean, including union leaders, took over the legislative body there to protest vaccine passports and mandates, and along with the entire austerity regime, they're living under under the control of billionaire former central billionaire former banker Emmanuel Macron. This happened, and it's just been completely ignored in in media. This is part of the this this freedom movement that's taking place around the world, while authorities try to make the word freedom a kind of a dirty word. It's it's, it's so it's very threatening, and it's understandable that you would have these projects crop up. Where intelligence is involved, and so uh, so it's an, so yeah. when so when you're watching someone do a uh, a critical video uh, or a video trying to knock down people who are anti-war or anti-imperialism, like this show, your show, uh, they well, there's a good chance they've been co-opted, is what you're saying, right? That's what you're saying. There's a good chance they've been co-opted, well, and there's more than one way to co-opt. Like, does would you say an M, uh, you know a six-figure MSNBC contract would also serve that purpose to silence someone and get them to go along with the narrative? There's lots of different ways they could do this, right? I mean, on Syria, yeah, there was a huge level of co-optation. Like, so many of the people involved in attacking us at least had some connection to one of these intelligence cutouts, like. It, it was it was just so obvious. I don't need to go into details now, um, but there, there 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 is there's a lot of fear, and there are other reasons why people despise you and what you're saying about COVID. Then you know some spook comes in the room and tells them what to say. The point, but the point is that some of the most sophisticated media and the messaging around it, there there is is being dictated. By powerful interests. I mean, that's just clear. Like when we talked about the Great Barrington Declaration, when three uh, pretty prominent well credentialed epidemiologists got together and presented an alternative to this ham fisted attempt at eradicating COVID 
uh, that would do less damage to workers and society. When they came under a coordinated attack, but it started in progressive media. Uh, the Nation magazine published one of the first attacks by Greg Gonsalves, this Yale epidemiologist on the Great Barrington Declaration. And it turns out from emails that came out through FOIA that Gonsalves was working hand in glove ah. with NIH Director Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci to attack them. And, you know, there's so many other attacks on GBR and progressive publications. This was coordinated. And what is the NIH or, or what, are, what are Fauci involved in? That is another aspect of the permanent state that connect, connects directly to the in military intelligence apparatus, or at least indirectly. This biomedical establishment or regime that has shown its face for the first time to the public in a very clear way in this pandemic is just another aspect of the same apparatus we've been talking about, this permanent bureaucracy that we never elected, uh, that, that has very little transparency. And they're going after their critics. I mean, the White House has gone directly after RFK Jr. Fauci's going after him in the open, but they've been going after him behind closed doors. And as Corey Morningstar, the researcher, revealed the same public relations firm that was used by the Syrian White Helmets, Purpose UK, has been hired by the UN to, quote unquote, flood the zone on Twitter to push back at COVID skeptical narratives. So the, who's doing that? The, the PR firm that helped create the Syrian White Helmets. It's called Purpose UK. No shit. Corey, Corey Morningstar tweeted about this. Uh, Vanessa Bealey, who you know reported a lot on Syria, helped expose the White Helmets deception. She noted that uh, Orlando Isinger, who is a, who is a filmmaker, is involved in many film projects on COVID, which are obviously promoting the official agenda. He's the guy who made the Netflix film on the Syrian White Helmets that somehow won a I, um, an Oscar, an, an Academy Oscar. Award. I mean, it wasn't even a very good film, but it was all about, you know, the Oscars turned into a vehicle for empire. Yes. So the same people that have been involved at the ground level, on a granular level, in the most important aspects of the dirty war on Syria are now being repurposed to save the COVIDian regime that has been tormenting us for two years. And uh, it, it's not, so it doesn't just stop with this, this project. We just focused on one project, but there are many more. Okay, well, I can't wait. I hope you get some more information. I hope you get some more leaked material, leaked your way. I would love to find out uh, who's in bed with the intelligence community here in the United States who have YouTube shows. That would be fantastic to find out. <laughs> uh, you know it's not me. You know, I'm not one of them. Boy, I wish I was. That would be fun. Wouldn't have to worry about anything. Nobody's making an offer. That's the whole point. That's my problem. You know, I'm not, I'm as corruptible as the next guy. Why is anybody making an offer? All they want to do is take me down. Anyway. I don't think so. I don't think so. And, you know, yeah, the, the term intelligence community is an oxymoron. They're yes. neither communal nor particularly intelligent. So the people <laughs> they've been working with were the, are, are some of the most discredited YouTubers and, and cable personalities. I just think of everything that that uh, John Brennan said on MSNBC over the last four years. It's all been discredited. Yep. Yeah, everything. I mean, people hate them. I hope so. I hope people remember that they're supposed to hate the CIA and the liars uh, for imperialism. I hope they remember that. But I don't think, you know, again, because of Trump... Uh, people's minds went to mush and now so suddenly the people who were their biggest enemies, now they consider their friends because they pretend to not like Trump. Um, but I, I, I agree that the CIA actually didn't like Trump because he was a little bit of a problem for them. He wouldn't do exactly everything they said to do. And they didn't like that. And so they leaked the contents of his phone call to the Ukraine. They did the same thing to Joe Biden, by the way. He's not in office of fucking five seconds. And they're releasing transcript of one of his phone calls to the leader of India, I think. And what do you think that is for? That is for them to let Joe Biden and his crew know we're in charge. We're in yep. charge, not you. And don't you get any fucking ideas. 
That's yep. what that's about. Because Joe Biden can't put a tap on the fucking that guy's phone at the CIA. They're the ones who do the phone tapping. <laughs> that's okay. He's not going to get Andy Slavitt to go over and do some phone tapping for him. He's going to need the guys from the CIA to do it. Well, yeah, I think, you know, when you hear let's go, Brandon, it's not just about Biden. It's about the people that control him. And I think so many people understand that Biden isn't really the guy in charge. Oh, he's not in charge. No, he's not in charge. And yeah, so, let's go. Brandon is about let's get rid of let, let uh, uh, fuck this regime. That's what it's. I think it means. Go ahead. Totally. Yeah. Fuck this regime. Fuck the corporate media that lied about what the crowd was actually chanting. <laughs> they weren't chanting for Brandon, Brandon. The race car driver. It's just <laughs> you're just a, you're just a bunch of liars. So it's about the corporate media, too. And so much was happening across the West that threatened the establishment leading up to the implementation of the most horrific stage of the COVIDian regime with the vaccine uh, mandates and passports, the demonization of the unvaccinated, all that rhetoric. It really suggested a fear of populism, um, a fear of anti-establishment grassroots upsurge. And here we are at the end of the year uh, with Omicron kind of exposing the failure of all the various techno fixes and the populist surge is returning. The establishment is terrified. And I don't see, I don't know if they have a, a strategy at this point. They, they don't, I mean, the Democrats don't even know who they're going to run in 2024. So from a perspective of, you know, an organizer, someone who, you know, opposes the establishment, this would seem like a very good time to get out in the streets, organize people. But it's sad to see that so much of the left, at least in the US, has accepted the COVIDian narrative and will not even use this moment as a way to examine, critique, and criticize power in the no. way it's operating and manipulating people. There, are, Many of them are even hostile to the kind of reporting that I've been overseeing at the gray zone, where we're just using, we're just continuing to critique the scaffolding of power and how it is trying to manipulate us psychologically against the backdrop of COVID. So, I, I mean, anyway, there are some encouraging aspects of this. When you see the fear of the establishment, we should be somewhat encouraged. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, Max Blumenthal, I appreciate you. Everybody should check out that article uh, over at thegrayzone.com. Uh, it's fantastic, and all the work you guys do over there is fantastic. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for coming on, and uh, have a happy new year. Hopefully we'll see you in the new year. Thanks, and I'll be having uh, Caleb Maupin on this week to talk about this more. So check out my live stream, Foreign Agents at Rockfin. Oh, foreign agents. I I gotta put that in your bio on your bio when I read it. I always miss it's a long that bio. Yeah, foreign <laughs> agents over at Rockfin. Everybody come see our live stand-up shows. We're coming to Raleigh, North Carolina at the end of January and Philadelphia in February. See you there. <laughs>